morning. Thank you for joining us for worship. We're continuing our journey with mystics, and our mystic this week is a philosopher and brilliant scholar, Simone Fay. She had a conversion experience that was helped along by this poem by George Herbert called Love. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back. Guilt of dust and sin, but quick-eyed love observing my me grew slack from my first entrance in. Drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand, smiling, and did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have married them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners, so they may, may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have never received their reward, but whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, and do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you trespasses. Attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. These are the words Simone Weil spoke. As her, she developed her philosophy of how to lead a life, of what it meant to live a life, towards the end of her life, she encountered God and went from, from being a secular Jewish atheist to experiencing the presence of Jesus and transforming herself because of that faith. Most people in her world pushed religion aside as the opiate of the masses. But for Simone Weil, that religious experience up to change part of who she was and how she lived her life in the world. And one of the things she learned about that time is how do we give our intention? 
to what we're encountering. And for Simone Weil, giving our intention was always important. One of the first memories described by her and about her is giving up sugar because she was born during the time of the First World War and the soldiers at the front couldn't eat sugar. So as a young child, she refrained from sugar until they could eat sugar. And while she was an intellectual and studied and became a philosopher, she always wanted to be with the people that she was thinking about. And so she did many things in her life, from working in a Renault factory to joining the struggle against fascism in Spain, working in the vineyard. But what I want to focus on is what happened to her as she came to have this mystical experience of God, to experience the real and true presence of Jesus in her life. The first encounter she describes in her spiritual autobiography took place shortly after she was injured working in the Renault factory. She was taken by her parents to Portugal to a small fishing village, and she describes how wretched she felt because she couldn't even do the work of the factory work. And she had learned in that experience that those who were in that factory were so oppressed that they could never rise up and transform the world the way those around her talked about it in their Marxist heritage. And so she was discouraged because of her actual experience of the labor of working in that factory. And so while she was in that fishing village recovering from the accident, she watched a procession take place among the villagers in honor of their patron saint. It was evening and there was a full moon over the sea. The wives of the fishermen were in procession making tour of all the ships, carrying candles and singing what must certainly be very ancient hymns of heart-rending sadness. Nothing can give any idea of it. There the conviction was suddenly born upon me that Christianity is preeminently the religion of slaves, that slaves cannot help belonging to it, and I among others. So what she experienced from those fishing village women singing about their patron saint is that Christianity as a faith was born out of the lowest, the poorest, the most impoverished. That it provided people of faith coming from those traditions a refuge. Her second encounter occurred after her family went to Assisi. And in Assisi, she went to the place where it said that St. Francis prayed. And while she was there in the spot where St. Francis prayed, for the first time in her life, she says, she was brought down on her knees. Her third encounter with God occurs in 1938. They and her mother were attending Holy Week services at the Solzme Monastery. And they had attended, because her mother is, remember, a secular Jew, not because of the faith, but because they had heard of the beautiful aesthetic that was sung by the monks in the chanting they did, and they wanted to experience that aesthetic, that beauty found in the chanting. And in that moment, in those services where she heard the chanting, she says that Christ himself came down and took me. Here's how she described it. In 1938, I spent 10 days at Soul Smith, from Palm Sunday through Easter Tuesday. Following all of the liturgical services, I was suffering from splitting headaches. Each sound hurt me like a blow by an extensive effort of concentration, I was able to rise above this wretched flesh and to leave it to suffer by itself. 
heaped upon in a corner, and to find a pure and perfect joy in the unimaginable beauty of the chanting and the words. This experience enabled me by analogy to get a better understanding of the possibility of love, loving divine love in the midst of affliction. And while she was there, she encountered a young English Catholic who introduced her to the poems of the Romantic Era, especially the poem of George Herbert called Love, in which he says, Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back. It's the poem I read to you at the beginning of the service. And she started memorizing that poem, and when she would have her horrible mind grade, she would recite that poem about love. And during one of those times when she was reciting that poem about love, Christ came down and took possession of me. Moreover, in this sudden possession of me by Christ, neither my senses nor my imagination had any part. I only felt in the midst of my suffering the presence of love like that which one can read in the smile on a beloved's face. Her faith has gradually gone farther and farther and closer and closer to God. And then she describes how the Lord's Prayer came to have a meaningful place and impact in her life, where she fleshes out that idea of attention so here's her description of what happens when she reads the Lord's Prayer. Until last September, I had never once prayed in all my life, at least not in the literal sense of the word. I had never said any words to God, either out loud or mentally. Last summer, doing Greek with tea, I went through the Our Father word for word in Greek. We promised each other to learn it by heart. I did not think he ever did so, but some weeks later, as I was turning over the pages of the gospel, I said to myself that since I had promised to do this thing and it was good, I ought to do it. I did it. The infinite sweetness of this Greek text so took hold of me that for several days I could not stop myself from saying it over all the time. A week after I began the vine harvest, I recited the Our Father in Greek every day before work. And I repeated it very often in the vineyard. Since that time, I have made a practice of saying it through once each morning with absolute attention. If during the recit recitation my attention wanders or goes to sleep in the minutest degree, I begin again until I have once again succeeded in going through it with absolute pure attention. Sometimes it comes about that I say it again out of sheer pleasure, but I only do it if I really feel the impulse. The effect of this practice is extraordinary and surprises me every time, for though, although I experience it each day, it exceeds my expectations at each representation. At the very first words, tears tears my thoughts from my body and transports it to a place outside space where there is neither perspective nor point of view. The infinity of the ordinary expanses of perception is replaced by an infinity to the second and sometimes the third degree. At the same time, filling every part of this infinity of infinity, there is silence. A silence which is not an absence of sound, but which is the object of a positive sensation. More positive than the sound, Noises, if there are any, only reach me after crossing this silence. Sometimes also during this recitation or at other moments, Christ is present with me in person, but his presence is infinitely more real, more moving, more clear than on the first occasion when he took possession of me. She gives her full attention to the Lord's Prayer. How many of us have done that? How many of us have stopped and prayed the Lord's Prayer and experienced it in the deepest wells of our inner being, have reached the point of silence where God touches us. Simone Bay, who never gets baptized, so she never officially becomes a Christian, has a lot to teach us about how living into our faith through the use 
the Lord's Prayer. As a practice that helps us to encounter God, to encounter infinity, the mystery that is all, to show us what it's like to be in the presence of God. And what's our practice? To say the Lord's Prayer each day. And I know I keep encouraging you to do this. But what if you did it and gave it your full attention? Your purest attention? What if you said the Lord's Prayer each day, each morning before you started the day? What if you said it not in that fast, rote way we do, but intentionally and slowly, allowing the words of the prayer to guide your life and your being, to show you what it means to live a life in Christ? What if you allowed the Lord's Prayer to transform your being, to help you live out a life of love and attention? I invite you this week, as you think about our service, to stop during the week and take moments to pray the Lord's Prayer. To stop and sit with those comfortable, comforting words. Those words that in this last year, I said with my father while he was dying, and I said with Ken while he was dying, Words that they didn't have other words, but they both were able to speak those words of the Lord's Prayer with me there at the end. What if you stop each week? What if you stop each day and intentionally say the Lord's Prayer, allowing God's presence to surround you for love to bathe you welcome? As I was describing to you that Simone Weil made a practice of saying the Lord's Prayer each day. She made a practice of giving it her full attention um, because she describes attention as the rarest, purest form of generosity. It presupposes faith and love. Absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. And so she said the Lord's Prayer each morning and if her attention wasn't fully in the prayer, she would say it again and again and again until she reached that pure attention. So this morning I thought we would pray the Lord's Prayer. So first we're going to get the fast doing it by rote out of our, out of our system. So I invite you to say the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I want you to breathe in deep. I want to settle yourself deep into your soul. 
And this time, we're going to pause between each line of the Lord's Prayer. I want the words of the Lord's Prayer to grab your attention and hold it and pull you deep. Let us fix our attention and pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We ask today for our daily bread. We ask that everyone receives the bread they need for this day and every day. So I invite you to give your gifts that they may be used to help people receive their daily bread. Let us pray. We worship you with our words and with our songs, God, and we praise you with our money. Everything we have is yours. And these offerings are for the work of your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. All right, if you haven't already grabbed your communion elements and put them before you, I invite you to press pause and go grab some bread, crackers, donuts, cake, and some wine, juice, water, and bring them before you. And then start me up again. All are invited, all are welcome here to participate in communion. I want to read to you the passage from scripture to explain the story behind this tradition. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. 
he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. The bread reminds us that any life, no matter how broken or sick or distorted it may become, can be made whole again. The cup reminds us that any life, no matter how empty or lonely or isolated, may become, it may become, may be filled again. I want you to participate in communion with me. By using a meditation based on a passage from Father Richard Rohr of Franciscan Peace. Take your whole life in your hands as Jesus did. Hold the bread and the wine in your hands. Next, I want you to thank God, who is the origin of your goodness. Your life is pure gift, so let's make a choice of gratitude, appreciation, and abundance, which decenters the self. Eucharistio means, in Greek, to give thanks. So I invite you to give thanks. Break it. Give it away and don't protect it. The sharing of the small self will be the discovery of the truth. Unless the grain of wheat dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. The broken grain becomes broken bread. Cube on that. Drink up. By drinking and eating, you are participating in the very life of God, the body and blood of the church. Let us pray. May we feed as we have been fed. May we forgive as we have been forgiven. May we love as we have been loved. Amen. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will. That Jesus loves you and always will. That I love you and always will. May you focus your attention. May you draw near to love. May you experience the generosity of God. Amen. Oh.